All right, we are going to get started with our next session. Um, and first up, we have uh, Professor Earl Bellinger talking about uh, astrocytomic probes. Thank you. Well, first, let me begin by sincerely thanking the organizers for inviting me here. Um, it's a real honor to be the primary speaker at this meeting where there's so many bright minds showing so many interesting results. So thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm Earl Bellinger. Um, I'm new faculty at Yale, where I lead the Yale Astro ML Research Group, or YAML for short. Um, we're about a dozen people working on problems in astronomy. Um, and uh, let me say, uh, because this is an NSF meeting, if the topics we talk about here today are of interest to you, then um, maybe consider putting in an, uh, uh, an NSF application to come to bring your, your research, your techniques um, to, to our group at Yale. Um, and more generally, uh, I don't know most of you here, so please come and say hi and introduce yourself. I'd be really happy to meet uh, all of you. Okay, so um, uh, my background uh, in education is in computer science, but I fell in love with uh, variable stars. And so I want to tell you um, why I kind of uh, decided to put all of my, uh, my eggs in that basket and, um, and focus on this uh, extraordinary um, various sets of data about variable stars. So let's begin um, with the splendor of variable stars. So a first basic fact is that the sky is variable. So here's um, one night of observations of the globular cluster M3, where there's about half a million stars. And you can see these stars are changing in brightness over time. If we look at one particular star, um, you can see that every 13 hours, like clockwork, it, it shoots up in brightness and then slowly decays away. And there's a lot of structure here in, in the light curve that you can see. And of course, in the background is a, a model that we've fit using uh, machine learning. And so, um, well, there's a lot of things that you can do with this kind of data. Um, our sort of begins actually here in Cambridge back in uh, about a century ago. Henrietta Swan Leavitt, one of the so-called Harvard computers, was analyzing the data from these pulsating stars and noticed a very amazing pattern which is that the, the stars that take longer to uh, increase and then decrease in their brightness again, those are the ones that are brighter. Now, this period luminosity relation has profound implications. It means that these stars are standard candles, which means that if you can measure how long it takes them to change in their brightness, you can infer how bright they should really be. The, distance between, the difference between how bright they are and how bright they're observed then gives you the distance. So this is an extraordinary tool that can be applied throughout astronomy. It, uh, it took only a decade later for it to make um, a huge slash. Um, uh, Hubble applied this technique um, to look uh, and found a, um, a variable star in Andromeda. Now, at this time in the history of astronomy, uh, the great, the so-called great debate of astronomy was raging. People didn't know whether or not the universe was the only structure in the Milky Way, or if there were also objects external to the Milky Way. When, when, when Hubble discovered a variable star in Andromeda, he was able to infer that Andromeda must be at an extraordinary distance from us, um, thereby settling the great debate of astronomy and, and, and demonstrating that external galaxies exist. He sent uh, his results to Harlow Shapley, his opponent, one of his opponents in this debate. Shapley, as uh, soldier said, uh, this is the letter that destroyed my universe when, when he got these <laughs> results. Um, but Hubble didn't start stop there. You know, this was certainly enough to cement his legacy in astronomy. But he continued to apply this technique of measuring distances to to more galaxies. And what he found was remarkable: the 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 galaxies that are more distant from us are the ones that are receding from us faster. He discovered the expanding universe. And he applied the original technique of machine learning, ordinary linear regression, to to work out the um, the, the the relation between these two variables. And you can see with his original data, he got um, some value of the Hubble constant of 350 or so. You'll notice here the units will cancel out because kilometers and megaparsecs are both units of distance. So the slope of this has units of one over time. He measured the age of the universe. And at that time, it was about 3 billion years. Uh, using modern measurements of variable stars, we find uh, 13.8 billion years, of course. Um, and so Along with shattering uh, Shapley's universe, he also shattered Einstein's universe and, and showed that, um, the, the, that we have an expanding universe. Um, now, the story doesn't stop there. Um, so at this time, it was not really clear what these variable stars were. A lot of people assumed them to be binaries, 
but the data was inconsistent with the uh, binary hypothesis. Eddington and others worked out that these must, in fact, be pulsating stars. Now, this had some pretty profound implications. At this point, the prevailing theory of stellar evolution was that stars were born as giants and then contracted down to, let's say, the sun. Um, but in fact, these pulsating stars, they pulsate with a period that's proportional to their mean density. So if they're contracting, then their period should be measurably changing. And so he falsified the prevailing theory of stellar evolution. In fact, um, Eddington, you know, he was a Quaker, but he was bold enough to call it uh, an unburied corpse, you know, some forceful language, but perhaps uh, justified because um, a few decades earlier, uh, Kelvin had used this theory uh, to kind of bully uh, Darwin into uh, revising on the origin of species. And Darwin died thinking that, you know, maybe evolutionary theory has some problems because the sun must be younger. Um, by the way, he talks about meteoric theory here. The idea is that not only does it contract, but it heats up because it accretes uh, meteorites. Um, and uh, Eddington went on to speculate. You know, Eddington was a, a scholar of Einstein, which was rare at his time because uh, their, their countries were at war. And he went on to say, you know, Einstein has told us that E equals MC squared. Maybe that's how stars get their energy. Maybe they survive through um, nuclear fusion. And of course, that's what we recognize to be the situation today. And so, um, yeah, the first basic point is that variable stars have been extremely influential in shaping our understanding uh, of our place in the universe um, from uh, showing that external galaxies exist to showing that, uh, that we live in an expanding universe and giving us a theory of um, stellar evolution. So, um, but the pulsation theory was not without its, um, its challenges. People started discovering um, additional periods in these uh, in, in some types of pulsating stars, and that was difficult to reconcile with the prevailing theory, which was that these must be radial mode pulsators. But this was all laid to rest in the 1960s when we discovered that even our own sun is a pulsating star. It's just that the amplitudes are extremely small, so it takes pretty sophisticated technology to measure. The, the surface of the sun is moving by only meters per second. It has a period of five minutes on, on average. We can see thousands of different pulsation modes in the sun. And this has granted us unprecedented insights into the solar structure. Um, so these, these modes, they're not merely at the surface of the star, but in fact, they, 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 they probe the entire star. And that allows us to look inside of our sun. So here's a, a modern picture of our sun. And um, you can see uh, the visible pattern of convection on the surface, as well as some spots and other things. Um, and thanks to uh, helioseismology, we can look inside the sun and measure its structure. And we find that its structure is very consistent with the theory of stellar evolution, which is that it has a nuclear burning core that's transporting energy uh, through radiation, and then the outermost 30% or so is transporting energy uh, through convection. And it's precisely this turbulent convection that's responsible for the oscillations in our sun. Um, the, 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 the convection causes the whole star to uh, ring like a bell, exciting um, thousands of observable oscillation modes simultaneously. Now, the sun is just one star, and of course, we want to do this for other stars as well. Um, other stars with these extremely small amplitudes, like our own sun, due to the uh, exquisite insights that they give into the um, uh, stellar interior. So for the non-astronomers in the room, um, this is a hertzsprung russell diagram showing how uh, the sun will evolve over time. So it was born down here at a certain temperature and luminosity, and it'll, it'll turn into a giant over a few billion years. And in doing so, its internal structure will change and the way in which it pulsates will change. And so by measuring the pulsations in these types of stars, we get to validate our theory of stellar evolution. And we get to uh, yeah look inside these stars and, and do a, a number of interesting tests uh, of physics. Um, so, like I said, this is extremely challenging to do. Um, one one thing is that the amplitudes are small, and the other is that the the pulsation periods are so fast. You know, five minutes. How do you resolve that? Well, you need to observe more more frequently than the star is pulsating. Um, in astroseismology, we benefit from the fact that we have the same requirements that the exoplanet folks have, which is that, you know, if you want to find a transiting exoplanet, you stare at a star for a long time and you wait for a planet to pass in front so the light will dip. So the Kepler mission did precisely that. They looked at one fixed field of view in the sky for four straight years and took an image once per minute. 
Um, and so here's uh, just one week of time series from Kepler of a, uh, of a solar type star. And it kind of looks like noise, but when you take the Fourier transform, you can see the clear signal emerges. Each of these is a significant peak representing a low degree oscillation mode. And so um, due to the geometric cancellation of integrated starlight, we can only see the global modes, but actually nature is fortunate. Those global modes are precisely the ones that probe the core of the star. So we're not seeing some surface effect. We actually really do peer into the hearts of stars. And so just to give you an example, I mean, th this is the familiar thing. These are just spherical harmonics. I've indicated the quadrupolar modes here. Now, this is a, uh, an exaggeration. Stars are not pumped up to this, uh, to this amplitude. Actually, there's some fun situations where that might happen, but you can ask me about that in the questions. Um, and, uh, and so you can see that there's um, a bunch of quadrupolar modes pulsating at the same time. Um, these are distinguished by their radial order, so the, basically the number of zero points interior to the star. Um, you can also see that there's clear structure in this diagram. The modes are roughly evenly spaced by a, a number that we call the large frequency separation, or delta nu, which is um, given by the root mean density of the star. And then there's also a small separation that, that links all these modes uh, adjacent to each other. Now, th this is quite extraordinary. This small separation you can work out pretty much from first principles uh, turns out to be sensitive to the mean molecular weight gradient in the core of the star. Now think about what that means. Well, when because nuclear fusion is, is going on in the center of the star, it's converting hydrogen to helium, it's modifying the mean molecular weight gradient. By measuring this small separation, we are able to measure the ages of stars. Now, just to give you uh, a sense of scale here, um, the preferred unit for the astroseismologist is microhertz. 3,000 microhertz is about five minutes, like, like, like I said before. Okay, um, so how are we doing in terms of observations? Well, Kepler gave us um, uh, quite, quite some data on dwarf stars and giants um, about a decade ago. We, we only have up order 100 uh, high quality observations of dwarf stars. For each of these um, stars, you know, when, when I say dwarf, I'm, I'm referring to like solar type stars, for example. Um, each of these stars, we get up order 50 unique low degree modes of oscillation. Um, giant stars are better, um, you know, they're bigger, their amplitudes are larger, so we can see a lot more of them, so that's been very profitable. Um, currently ongoing is the test mission, which is run here uh, primarily at MIT, uh, and that's been fantastic for giant stars. Um, and soon, we're about to have a data explosion with the forthcoming W-first and Plato missions, and I'm one of the scientists uh, working on the, the Plato mission. And so you can see we're, we're, we're getting up order millions of uh, these pulsating stars with tons of oscillation modes per star. And so astroseismology is truly entering the big data era. So the question is, we have all this data, what can we do with it? And so I'm going to take you through um, a few uh, different areas where astroseismology can shine light um, in increasing order of, uh, <laughs> let, let's say, absurdity. Okay, so let's start <laughs> with uh, stellar physics. Um, so we want to understand how stars evolve. Stars should, we should be able to predict um, how these stars pulsate in each of their phases of evolution. And we should be able to, uh, because this grants us insight into the internal stellar structure, we can really calibrate uh, our stellar evolution models. So um, I'm one of the developers of a code called MESA, which is an open source stellar evolution code, modules for experiments in stellar astrophysics. Um, and um, yeah, we supply cell evolution models to the community. Anyone can download it, anyone can run their own models, et cetera. Um, I know there's some astronomers in the room. How many people here have used MESA? Yeah, okay, uh, small number. Um, but uh, you know, the rest of you can check it out. Um, and then gyre is a stellar pulsation code, so we can calculate uh, how, how, these, um, how, how these models uh, oscillate. And um, yeah, so we do this by solving the equations of stellar structure, the equations of stellar evolution, and then eventually the equations of uh, stellar pulsation, so the uh, physics simulation. Um, and so here's an example of you know, the evolution of a couple of stars. Um, you can see how they evolved in the hertz von russell diagram. So this is like over eight or so billion years, how, how their luminosity increases, how their, how their temperature changes, and then correspondingly, their internal structure changes as well. Now, um, the thing to know is that these are, in fact, uh, sound waves that we are seeing in these stars. The stars are playing music for us. And so the critical thing 
that these oscillations reflect is the internal sound speed profile. And so that's that's the thing that we can uh, essentially probe with astroseismology. And so, of course, we do this with uh, machine learning. So the basic uh, schematic is that we generate an enormous grid of theoretical stellar evolution and pulsation models, and then we use various machine learning techniques to try to characterize the stars using those techniques. Um, so uh, there's we, we've taken a, a pretty large number of different ways of going about this problem. So I'll give just one example. So th this is work led by um, Mark Khan, who's a postdoc here at MIT, soon to be starting faculty in Singapore. Um, and in this, in this paper, we, we treated it as um, an inverse problem where you input the observations and then you output uh, distributions of what the parameters could be, for example, for the age of the star. There's other approaches. For example, you can treat it as a forward problem and train a neural network as an emulator and then do Bayesian sampling. That's another approach that we're, we're taking in our group. Um, may, many different um, roads lead to uh, similar results with different reasons why you might want to do it in, in some different cases. So how well can astroseismology characterize stars? Well, here you can see the uncertainty um, that we get out um, by propagating the, the observational errors through um, our uh, machinery. You see that we can get surface gravities to like a tenth of a percent. So that's, that's pretty extraordinary. Um, radii to 1%, masses to 3%, and ages to 10%. Ages to 10%, that's remarkable. People can't even guess my age within a factor of two. And we can do that for a star. <laughs> Um, and so what I'd like to argue is that um, these ages are driving a revolution uh, throughout uh, many different fields of, of astronomy. Um, so one, one uh, quick example that I can show is we see lots of stars in binary systems. If we're able to resolve the oscillation modes in each of them, we can test the hypothesis that these stars were born at the same time. And so by running each component of this binary, you know, component A and component B, through our machinery, we can measure the ages of these stars, and we find out, in fact, yes, most likely these stars did form at the same time. So that's a, a beautiful uh, verification of that um, idea. What else? Well, so I told you that the sun uh, transports energy in its outer layers by convection. Uh, if the sun's not massive enough to have convection in its core, but as you pump up the mass of the star, you expect at some point that convection becomes efficient in the stellar core. But theory can't accurately predict um, the, when this will turn on and what the boundaries of convection zones really are in stars. But with seismology, we can measure this. So here's um, quite a few stars that we applied this machinery to. And we're able to measure this transition between radiative cores and convective cores. Um, Inside the hearts of stars is nuclear fusion. And so our simulations are, of course, sensitive to those inputs of what you assume of the efficiency of various uh, nuclear reactions to be. Um, and so in this paper, we looked at um, our own sun and we propagated through those uncertainties in uh, nuclear reaction rates and then checked which of those models are actually compatible with the helioseismic data. And we found that actually, uh, the, the, the pulsations of the sun provide a more precise constraint on nuclear reaction rates than theory and laboratory measures give us. Not too shocking, given that the sun is a nearby nuclear fusion reactor, but pretty remarkable that we can do that with um, uh, observations of uh, solar oscillations. Okay, um, we also have a very interesting inverse problem in um, astroseismology, which is that when we when we make these models of stars, you know, we use this theory of stellar evolution, we fit the models to a particular star, and we see that um, the models are in very broad agreement with the observations. The, they pulsate at approximately the right frequency, the right modes are excited, etc. But the, the data is so exquisitely precise that we can actually tell the difference between the stars and the stellar evolution models. Our best models are not uh, the stars are not in the same space as uh, the, the structures produced by stellar evolution theory. We can tell at the level of fine details. Even when we propagate through all of the uncertainties that we know how to propagate through into our stellar evolution models, you still find that there are significant differences between the pulsation frequencies of your stellar models and the pulsation frequencies that you observe in the stars. That's because we can measure these frequencies to something like one part in 10,000. It's among the most precise data uh, available in astrophysics. And so then we have this interesting inverse problem. Okay, our models don't have the right structure. What is the right structure? 
And so here you can set up a problem where you say, okay, let's take the difference in frequency between our best model of this pulsating star and the actual uh, pulsation frequencies of the star and try to infer the differences in structure between our, our, our model and, and the star. And that, that will shine a path towards uh, potentially improving theory of stellar evolution. And so um, we're taking a lot of different approaches to solve this uh, inverse problem. Um, uh, here I'll show some classical techniques, but currently we're playing around with um, uh, physics uh, informed neural networks and also um, using Bayesian sampling using uh, information field theory. Um, okay, so okay, this equation tells us we have the differences in frequency and they're related to the differences in structure times some response function. So this is how the uh, the individual pulsation mode frequency would change when you change the structure of the star. For example, if you increase the sound speed at this point inside the star, you increase the frequency, etc. And so these are a few different response functions for uh, one particular model. And so we applied this to um, one of the stars that I showed you previously. And here we're, we're measuring the core structure inside of this pulsating star. As far as I know, this is the actually the first measurement of the internal structure uh, of a distant star. And what you can see is that um, despite what I told you that the, the, there's differences in frequency, those differences are not arising from the near core region, at least as far as we can resolve from the stellar pulsation data. So that's that's pretty good. Um, it tells us that there's there, there's either physics wrong at the level that we can't resolve here, or the physics that's wrong are in the outer layers where our oscillation modes are not sensitive. Um, one of my PhD students, Lynn Buckley, has been applying this to more stars uh, observed by Kepler uh, and is finding greater differences um, in the core regions of some of these stars that are a bit more massive than our sun. And so the previous star that I showed is very solar-like, um, and these stars, you know, as our, our theory has been pretty well calibrated to, um, to the sun, um, but as you move away to more uh, different stars, um, bigger differences start to emerge. So this, this might tell us how we can ultimately improve our stellar evolution models. Okay, so stellar physics down, um, exoplanets. So everyone loves exoplanets. Um, and what I'd like to tell you is that astroseismology is the greatest benefit that the exoplanet researcher could have when trying to study their uh, exoplanet system. And the reason is very simple. If you measure a transit depth, um, you know, when, when your exoplanet going in front of the host star, um, you need to combine that information with the radius of the host star in order to determine the radius of the exoplanet. And astroseismology gives us the most precise measurements of uh, host star radius that are um, on offer. Here, here's the band of um, radii uncertainties that are offered by astroseismology. So the best um, measured exoplanets are the ones for which we can uh, constrain their host stars using astroseismology. In addition, once we have this exoplanet radius, and maybe a measure of its mass and other parameters as well, we can play the same game with planet models. And so here's another mixture density neural network where we take the inferred properties of the exoplanet and we pass it through in order to measure properties like um, the size of the core in that exoplanet. And you know, if there's a if there's an icy layer, et cetera. Okay. Um, galactic archaeology. So um, I told you that uh, astroseismology offers ages to 10%. Th this allows us to start trying to understand the chronology of our galaxy. Um, so uh, here's the structure uh, of our galaxy, which is hard to infer because we are inside of it. Um, uh, it it's composed of you know, um, a thin and a thick disk and a halo uh, with many globular clusters inside of it. And it seems that many of those globular clusters were actually formed um, outside of our galaxy and are being accreted. If, if we can uh, combine the ages of stars with their orbits that's revealed through, for example, the Gaia mission, with their chemistry revealed through large-scale spectroscopic surveys, then we can really start to put together a map of how the galaxy uh, formed and evolved over time. Um, so one great thing that that enables is comparison with cosmological simulations. So these are cosmological zoom-in simulations that start with uh, a universe of uh, dark matter 
and a bit of baryons, and you see how structure forms in the universe over time. And at the end, you get out nice Milky Way type galaxies. Um, and then we can then start making detailed comparisons between uh, the, the actual structure of this cosmological simulation of our Milky Way and our, and our actual uh, Milky Way. And so that's, that's work that's uh, ongoing in our group. Um, one thing that's going to really be a boon for this is the Plato mission. As I mentioned, um, uh, I'm, I'm working on the Plato mission, and um, uh, it's set to launch in a couple of years. Here you can see the field of view that was observed by Kepler. As I said, it only does one fixed field of view in the sky. Um, and of course, uh, Kepler is no more. It's no longer taking data. But uh, uh, Plato is going to be an all-sky mission, most of the sky at least. And so we're going to be able to do what we did uh, for Kepler uh, all over the sky. And so this is really going to be a mission for galactic archaeology. We're really going to be able to map out uh, the structure of our galaxy in great detail. Um, the other thing that's uh, extremely exciting is the forthcoming um, Thalassus T, which is going to give us um, pulsating stars in distant galaxies as well. And it, it will really allow us to characterize the complete population of dwarf galaxies surrounding uh, the Milky Way. Okay, now we get to uh, some fun stuff. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, the, the, our prevailing theories uh, in cosmology and astrophysics tell us that we live in a universe that's dominated by dark matter. Um, numerous lines of evidence uh, indicate this, such as the rotation curves of galaxies, and like I just showed you, um, cosmological theories appear to require uh, dark matter. Um, I realize I might be in an audience that's more sympathetic to this than the normal stellar physics audience, which is, uh, um, you know, somehow hasn't warmed up to this, even though it's probably the, the, the biggest uh, outstanding problem in astrophysics. Um, so we still don't know what the dark matter is made of, uh, nor its origin, but there are many uh, theories. And so um, uh, astroseismology provides a probe of um, potentially distinguishing some of those theories. So I'd like to tell you about just one of them. So in the 1970s, Hawking suggested that uh, an enormous population of black holes may have um, been spawned in the aftermath of the Big Bang. So these so-called primordial black holes uh, could have uh, almost any mass probably peaking at very low mass and the lowest of them having evaporated by the present day, um, and, but, but possibly even uh, supermassive in size. Um, and the asteroid mass window uh, for primordial black holes is still open to uh, explain all of the dark matter. And so um, Hawking even suggested that such a primordial black hole could have found its way inside of our own sun. And th this was offered as a solution to the solar neutrino problem at that time. We weren't getting as many neutrinos from the sun as we had expected. Um, and Hawking worked out that the neutrino flux could have been uh, lowered if the uh, some of the energy of the sun wasn't uh, fully supplied by uh, nuclear reactions, but instead by the uh, accretion onto the black hole. And so here's a picture of what this looks like. So embedded in the core of the star, you have a black hole. There's a cavity from which it accretes. Because, uh, because this accretion, you know, as you circle the drain, you generate a lot of friction. Energy um, can, can be released. If, if that energy is not simply dragged into the hole, then it will uh, re be released into the star and be used as an energy source driving convection in the outer layers around, around this cavity. And then you have the normal uh, stellar plasma on top of it. So um, I implemented this idea into MESA and simulated what stars, how stars would evolve if they have a primordial black hole at their core. So here on the left, you can see a normal star, uh, our normal sun. Um, th this is when it was born. This is the present day. And eventually it's going to turn into a giant and um, you know, incinerate the Earth. Um, and then over here on the right, you can see what happens when you put a primordial black hole in the core of the star. So we still have the normal evolution. Here's today. Um, you know, a lot of people are surprised you think that the star would simply fall into the black hole. But uh, because these primordial black holes have such low mass, it takes quite a long time to double your mass so many times to get up to the mass of the sun. And so in this particular simulation, we can take this asteroid mass black hole 
I mean, it, it could still be lurking in the sun and we would be none the wiser. Except soon the sun would start to dim as nuclear reactions shut off and the accretion onto the uh, black hole becomes uh, efficient and, and, and the radiation pouring out. And so then you start to see the, the black hole uh, luminosity um, going up and the star prematurely pops into a giant star. And it's quite an interesting giant star, in fact, because um, unlike a normal red giant, which has a core, these things uh, would be fully convective. Unlike a, a red giant, which is um, you know just mostly convective. And so if we go back to uh, an HR diagram, here I'm showing the evolutionary tracks of a few different stars. So this is the, the normal solar evolution track as it turns into a giant. And here's what happens when you put black holes of various masses into them. You see this dimming over time, and then it pops up into a giant. And these giants are to the red of the red giant branch. So these are so-called red straggler stars, which are not produced by ordinary single star evolution. Yet we do see these red stragglers. Now, I'm in no way convinced that this is their origin, but it's quite interesting that we can produce red stragglers by um, putting primordial black holes into the centers of stars. Um, and one result that I'll, I'll just highlight briefly, um, the student I've been working with, uh, Andy Centarelli, has a paper on the archive now where he looked at one of the most dark matter dominated dwarf galaxies. He found that, uh, you know, James Webb reveals that this dwarf galaxy has an enormous population of red straggler stars. So did population synthesis for these models and showed that they these models can qualitatively reproduce the population of red stragglers in that dwarf galaxy. So that's quite suggestive. Um, yeah, this, um, this fun project got picked up by the popular media. Um, so it was highlighted in science and nature astronomy, as well as on YouTube. Uh, it even got a PBS Space Time uh, episode. And um, there were also some more uh, questionable uh, headlines <laughs> about it as well. <laughs> all right. So, um, all right. The, the last note that I'd like to leave you on today, uh, because we're at the, um, the IIFI, um, uh, I'd like to tell you about one way in which um, astroseismology can actually uh, potentially lend constraints to string theory. And I'll preface this by saying I am no string theorist. I am a, a humble lover, lover of variable stars. But there's this great idea that goes back to um, Pierre de Marc and Lawrence Krauss, which says that perhaps um, the sun uh, and other stars can probe uh, varying gravity. And so the idea of this is um, you know, fairly straightforward. It's that uh, Einstein softened the uh, space time over Newtonian physics, and string theory softens the laws of physics over uh, general relativity. And part of the softening is that the gravitational constant can be promoted to a, a dynamical quantity that varies over uh, space and time. And so, a very simple prescription for how this variation can happen you just express it as a power law, because astronomers love power laws. And you say that, okay, uh, maybe in the past, the gravitational constant was stronger or weaker than it is today. Um, but that would have profound consequences for how stars evolve. If a star evolved from stronger gravity, you know, maybe you have convection in its core during its early evolution when you wouldn't normally have it. That would leave an imprint in the present day structure because your core would have been mixed. So we implemented this into MESA. And we, we you know, had this prescription for uh, variable gravity. And we applied it to um, one of the oldest stars in our galaxy. The star is about 11 billion years old. And it's low mass, low, lower mass than the sun. Here you can see evolutionary tracks, how the star evolves if it has um, stronger gravity in the past and weaker gravity in the past. And uh, all arriving to, you know, at the end point, arriving at the present day observed value of the gravitational constant. And so by adding this as a free parameter to our simulations, we were able to do Markov chain Monte Carlo and find the, the set of these, you know, uh, gravitational constant changes that are compatible with the astroseismic data. And we were able to find that the gravitational constant has changed by no more than five parts in a trillion per year over the last 11 billion years. Um, which is consistent with what you find when people have done uh, similar exercises um, with Big Bang nuclear synthesis, CMB measurements, um, uh, our sun, et cetera. Um, and so, so far, we find no astroseismic evidence for string theory, and general relativity is still the champion of gravity. 
So that's what I wanted to tell you today. Astroseismology allows us to look inside the stars, giving us measurements of their ages, masses, and radii. This has a, a huge number of applications throughout astronomy, such as characterizing exoplanets and understanding how our, our galaxy formed and evolved. We furthermore get to test and improve stellar evolution theory. Um, so we've learned the physics of stellar cores, how convection operates. We we're able to um, potentially improve our measurements of nuclear reaction rates. Um, we also have this interesting uh, inverse problem that we're tackling with machine learning. Where we're trying to tell the difference between our best models of uh, stellar structures and uh, the, the actual structure of the star. And finally, it can shed some light on potentially revolutionary physics, probing different uh, prescriptions for dark matter, and testing the stability of the fundamental constants of nature. Thank you. Thank you for that very interesting talk. Do we have questions? Well, thank you. That was really terrific. Um, I, I might have missed it at the very beginning, but could you say um, how how nearby, with the current methods, do the stars have to be to be able to resolve these incredibly tiny amplitude, very fast, uh, you know, seismic structures? I, mean, I can imagine we could be staring at our sun. You could stare at our sun. I can't do it for a long time and get you know really good data. But even within the Milky Way, which is kind of big, you know, for this scale. So before we get to next generation, um, you know, instrumentation, and, and, and if it's really limited to our kind of relatively near neighborhood, are there other concerns about to biases or are seismic signals different in, in quite different types of galaxies? That, that kind of basic question. Absolutely. Thank you. That, that's a great question. I'm really happy to uh, have the chance to clarify. First public service announcement, don't stare at the sun. Not, not a good idea. Um, yeah. So. For these extremely small amplitude pulsations, we can really only resolve the solar neighborhood. That's why we only have 100 solar type stars. They're extremely difficult to observe. Giant stars, we can see at greater distances, but still confined within our galaxy, at least when we're talking about these so-called solar type, solar-like oscillations. Um, however, some of the giants that I showed, uh, for example, in the intro slides, those we can see in, in distant galaxies, so those large amplitude uh, pulsators. Um, there is not great hope for us to see these small amplitude pulsations in other galaxies within our lifetimes. Um, you would need something like a 100 meter telescope on the moon, um, which people tell me is challenging to build. Uh, but I hope, you know, uh, maybe, maybe with how things are going, that will be a, uh, a possibility sooner rather than later, but I, I guess it's hard. Um, so yeah. At least in the, the foreseeable future, for the, the types of measurements that really allow us to probe the core structure of these stars, we're limited to stars in, in, in our uh, solar neighborhood. And these stars only span a pretty limited range of metallicities. They go from maybe minus two uh, up to uh, a bit uh, supersolar uh, in terms of uh, F over H. Um, there are a few quite metal poor stars for which there are astroseismic measurements probing down to. F over H of negative three, but that's like, um, you know, really a record. And so well, one thing we'd really love to do is um, probe even lower metallicities. And um, something we're working on is uh, trying to understand whether or not we can tell if a star is, for example, um, you know, population three or population 3.1, uh, kind of an absurd name, uh, through the seismic signal alone. That would be um, a really great find. Um, but yeah, again, we're only limited to the nearby stars where you you, you don't really expect the such low metallicities in there. Thanks for that great question. Other Uh, thank you. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, on the question of aging and also measuring the mass and radio stars, is there any additional complication if it is in a binary, especially like a particularly close binary with another star? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the stars that I showed, these are in such a wide separation that you we, we don't really ever expect to see, um, you know, a single orbit. 
I think their orbital period is like 10,000 years or something like that. If you have a close binary, then you get tidally forced oscillations. So you get a whole different type of pulsating star. And even when you're not so close, you can still get um, some interesting uh, effects. So yeah, uh, close binaries are very challenging. Another thing that's challenging about binary stars is they might share the same pixel, which means that you know in your seismic observations, when I showed this um, you know power spectrum of these stars, you would actually see both of the stars uh, in the same power spectrum. And there's a few examples where people have been able to actually disentangle um, that situation. So that that's quite interesting. Um, but yeah, binarity poses a lot of challenges, mostly to the observers. I was just curious about, uh, there's one slide where you have this movie of like spherical harmonics and you mm -hmm. mentioned that there are some stars with really big pulsations. So oh, you yeah. Tell us what's going on with that. Okay, yeah. Uh, thanks for that reminder. So, okay, th this is quite fun. Um, so we haven't discovered any yet, but um, the idea is that, okay, this is a quadrupolar mode, right? What else has quadrupolar geometry? If you had a triple star system where you have two massive stars in the inner binary, and then a low mass star has the tertiary component, right? Which is a configuration that we expect to be fairly common. So pretty much 100% of massive stars are in a binary. Um, what happens when those binary stars, the inner binary, they both turn into black holes and they merge with each other? They release enormous amounts of gravitational radiation. That gravitational radiation will pass through the star and it'll pump it up to look like this. So one day, hopefully in the next decade, maybe, uh, it's not inconceivable that we would actually see extremely large amplitude quadrupolar oscillations uh, forced by uh, binary black hole merger. That would be fun. Um, on that topic, uh, since you brought it up, um, uh, these these oscillation modes are sensitive to the uh, uh, stochastic gravitational wave background. And so a paper that's um, in preparation to be submitted is actually trying to use these measurements to put an upper bound on the power in the gravitational wave background at stellar frequencies. Now, this is excited by internal physics. So the, the peak of this um, and the power in this oscillation spectrum is 100% due to uh, convection and not due to gravitational waves, but that still allows us to put an upper bound on how much power is in the gravitational wave uh, spectrum at stellar frequencies. Thanks for thanks for asking that question. All right, time for one more quick question. All right, if not, we'll thank Professor Bowden Jordan.